On January 15th, 1974, Dennis left his house on a quick errand to go slay some peeps. He broke into the Otero family's house and snuffed every single person inside. He first took out the parents and made their two kids watch the whole thing. Damn, that's crazy. And the kids were too young to have to witness all of that. And I mean, no one should have to witness what went down, no matter what their age, but you get the point. When the 11-year-old daughter, Josie, watched her parents go down right before her eyes, she even shouted, Mommy, I love you. Well, if that's not the most gut-wrenching thing in the world, then I don't know what is. But even a young girl crying for her soon-to-be deceased mom wouldn't stop this monster because after both parents were slain, Dennis then dragged Josie down into the basement where she met the same fate. Before she took her last breath, she asked Dennis what was gonna happen to her. And in the most chill voice ever, he told her, well, honey, you're going to be in heaven tonight with the rest of your family. Uh, who is he calling honey? That girl was 11 years old and I don't think people typically execute other people they refer to as honey. I'm sure you've already guessed it, but the other kid who was there was also offed by Dennis. So in total, the dude whacked four people that day, a set of parents and two of their kids. Before Dennis left the crime scene, he did a quick little corpse photo shoot and snatched up the little girl's undergarments as a souvenir, which became a tradition for the rest of his crimes. After that, he went to his house to get ready for church where he served as the church council president. And the winner of the worst person in the world goes to Dennis Rader. But those four victims weren't all the members of the Otero family. Later that day, the three oldest kids came home from school to find the bodies of their parents and younger siblings. They obviously freaked out and called the cops, but no one could figure out who committed the crimes. And Dennis wasn't on their radar at all because he was living a totally different life on the surface, but the dude had a pretty messed up childhood. As a kid, Dennis's parents were all about that hashtag hustle. So they worked long days and didn't spend much time with their kids. So since Dennis wasn't getting attention from his parents, he had to find a hobby to fill the void. And most kids would take up a sport or hang out with kids in the neighborhood or something. But Dennis decided to torture animals in all of his free time. He was also into some other super awful stuff. As a kid, Dennis found out he had a thing for pain. Like, he was attracted to the feeling of it. And before Dennis went after his human victims as an adult, he basically tried out some of his moves on himself. Dennis also had a bunch of weird fantasies about really intense topics like torturing women. He was so obsessed with the idea of going after girls that he would legit cut out pictures of women from magazines that he was attracted to and draw ropes around their necks and make a demented victim mood board. Oh, and get this, Dennis would sometimes dress up as a woman just to creep on other gals in his neighborhood without seeming too suspicious. But somehow, literally no one knew about this because the dude was putting up quite the front in public. While Mr. Dennis was fostering his disgusting fantasies in private, he was out there pretending to be this down-to-earth guy with no issues whatsoever. So, Dennis grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And after graduating high school, he decided to go the college route and attend a private Christian university. After a year of mediocre grades, he dropped out. From there, he joined the Air Force, where he served for four years. Once Dennis got out of the military, he found himself a beautiful, God-fearing woman named Paula. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention this earlier, but Dennis was super religious, which is so confusing because he was such an awful criminal. But maybe he thought by attending church, he would make up for all of his terrible sins. In her defense, no one else knew about how insane Dennis was. He was really good about keeping everything on the down low. The couple tied the knot in 1971 and eventually had two kids, Carrie and Brian. In 1973, Dennis got his associate's degree in electronics and took on a job with ADT where he installed security alarms. And not long after that, Dennis got so in touch with his demented side that he made his first move on a human victim. Well, actually, 
four human victims. So after he took out the Otero family, investigators were acting all helpless. They couldn't figure out who the perp was, and Dennis didn't waste any time while they twiddled their thumbs. That spring, he went after a young college girl named Catherine. Meanwhile, his wife Paula was pregnant with their first child. See, I told you I wasn't kidding when I said he was living a double life. Okay, so Dennis had been stalking Catherine long enough to find out where she lived. And on April 4th, he posted up at her apartment waiting for her to come home. When she did, he jabbed her multiple times with a blade and constricted her neck until she fell lifeless. But Catherine's brother, Kevin, was home to hear the scuffle and must have gotten in Dennis's way at some point because he was hit with two bullets. Kevin actually survived the blows and later talked to investigators where he said Dennis was an average looking guy with a bushy mustache and psychotic eyes. Well, Dennis flew under the radar and continued to knock out other people. Before he preyed on his next victim, he wrote a detailed letter about his first crime against the Otero family. In the note, he said he was going to strike again and even gave himself the nickname BTK. Yo, my thing is, why did he give himself his own nickname? That's, that's a bit pathetic, don't you think? Anyway, Dennis wrote, all of this on a piece of paper and stuffed it into an engineering book at the public library. He then called the local newspaper and told them about the confession that he had just stashed in those pages. After the letter was discovered, detectives were still standing there shrugging their shoulders like, we don't know who this guy is. And they stayed that way for years. From 1974 to 1977, Dennis took a little vacay from his massacres to help take care of his new baby. But when 1977 rolled around, Dennis was itching to get back to his violent roots. He planned on going after a woman he had previously met at a bar, but she wasn't home. So Dennis settled for a random chick named Shirley. When Dennis got to Shirley's house, he locked up her kids in the bathroom, violated her, and wrapped his hands around her neck until she had no pulse. One of the worst parts about this one is the kids were watching the whole time through the peephole in the door. Based on Dennis's last family massacre, you'd think he'd also slay the kids, but apparently Shirley's phone rang in the middle of everything, so Dennis freaked out and left. Thank God. A little less than a year later, he performed the same cruel act on Nancy, or his next project, as he liked to call it. After Nancy's forced farewell, Dennis called the cops to report the crime. One month later, he sent a poem to the local newspaper that was titled, Shirley Locks. If you can't already tell by the name, the poem was all about Dennis's previous project where he rubbed out Shirley. A few weeks after his poem came out, Dennis wrote a letter to a TV station to claim responsibility for all of his terminations. In the letter, he said he was driven to slay these people by Factor X, which he characterized as a supernatural element that also motivated the most iconic executioners, like Jack the Ripper, Ted Bundy, and the Son of Sam. But Dennis wasn't going to out himself in a letter like that. No, he had a handful of other victims to eclipse before retiring. So instead of revealing his true identity, Dennis continued to go by the nickname BTK. But BTK's letters had quite a few misspellings and Dennis's wife would literally make jokes about how similar his spelling was to the mysterious perp. Paula would legit tell him, you spell just like BTK and laugh it off. Wait, that had to be so nerve wracking for Dennis. He probably thought he was caught red handed until Paula left and went about her day without acting like anything was up. By 1985, Dennis was 40 years old. He had gotten his bachelor's degree in administration of justice, had a second child with Paula and became a Boy Scout troop leader. Yep, he got a criminal justice degree in the middle of all of these slayings. So during a Boy Scout trip in 1985, Dennis claimed he had a headache and needed to leave to get meds. His car was parked by a bowling alley, so instead of getting in his whip, he popped inside the bowling joint, ordered a beer, and went out of his way to get some on his shirt to make it look like he was buzzing hardcore. After that, he called a cab and told the driver to take him to Park City so he could go after his next project. 
a 53-year-old woman named Maureen who lived in the neighborhood. When Dennis got to Maureen's pad, he did all of the classic BTK things, including cutting the phone line and waiting inside for his prospective victim to come home. But as soon as Maureen got home, Dennis noticed she had another man with her, which was totally unexpected. And Dennis didn't want to get into it with the other dude, so he literally waited in the closet until Maureen's visitor left at around 1 a.m. Once the coast was clear, Dennis popped out, turned on the bathroom light, and pounced on Maureen. After she was done for, Dennis dragged her out into the trunk of her own car and drove her to his church. He put plastic bags over the church windows so no one could see inside, and then he dragged Maureen's body down to the basement. He took a bunch of pictures of her corpse in different poses before dragging her upstairs and stuffing her into the back of the trunk. From there, Dennis drove off and dumped Maureen's remains in the ditch before going back to his Boy Scout troop. Why do I feel like I'm missing something? Did Dennis literally take Maureen into his church just to get post-mortem pics of her? That is so extra. While all of this is going on, the people of Kansas were freaked. They knew BTK was still out there and everyone was also cracking down on their home security systems, which Dennis often installed himself. Yeah, the dude was seriously installing all of these alarms that people were getting for protection against him. How insane is that? And Dennis's family was starting to panic too. They were really worried BTK would target them, but Dennis told them, don't worry, we're safe. Paula later mentioned that there was a mysterious sealed box Dennis kept in their home, but she never looked inside. Later we find out it had a bunch of mementos from Dennis's past crimes. I wonder what it's like to be that oblivious to the fact that your husband is a sadist slayer. And on to the next project for Dennis. In September of 1986, Dennis dressed up as a telephone repairman and knocked on the door of a 28-year-old woman named Vicky. She thought he was there to fix her phone line. So she was all like, yeah, sure, come on in. Dennis then cut the phone line, per the huge, and held a firearm to Vicky's head. He then forced her into the bedroom, tied her up, and constricted her airflow. After that, he did the whole photo shoot thing and then drove off in her car. Moments later, Vicky's husband came home to find his two-year-old son unattended in the living room, and even worse, his wife in the back bedroom hanging on to dear life. He immediately called 911, and Vicky was rushed to the hospital, but after just a few hours, she passed away. And still, detectives had no clue that Dennis was the perp responsible for all these slayings. Dennis took a bit of a break between Vicky and his next project, and during that time he got a job as compliance supervisor for the city. Dennis apparently took his new job way too seriously. He was all uptight about the rules to the point where we would measure the height of people's lawns and chase stray animals with weapons. It's interesting that Dennis was all about following weird neighborhood rules, but when it came to the actual law and moral code and religious beliefs, those were out the window. Like, I take everything way too seriously. Like, I won't even speed to keep up with the flow of traffic. So if you're anything like me, you're probably a little tired of hearing about all of these awful crimes. I mean, I love me a good true crime story, but some of them are just a bit more gruesome and exhaustive than others. So let's get through this last victim and find somewhat of a resolution. Deal. In the winter of 1991, Dennis was on another one of his Boy Scout trips when he slipped away. He went over to some old lady's house, busted through her sliding glass door with a cinder block, and dispatched her in the classic BTK manner. And you'd think after whacking 10 people, writing letters about these crimes, and calling the newspaper outlets, Dennis was bound to be caught. Like, there had to be at least one piece of evidence between all of these crime scenes that would lead to Dennis. But alas, the case went cold and nothing happened until 2004 when Dennis spotted a story in the local paper talking about the 30th anniversary of the Otero massacre. That's when Dennis decided he wanted to be the one to tell his story. So he started sending letters to law enforcement and media outlets. He filled letters with items that were related to all of his crimes. Pictures, word puzzles, sketches. This dude went all out. In February of 2005, Dennis sent a letter to the local news station with a floppy disk. 
For those of you unfamiliar with floppy disks, they're these flat square things that store files, kind of like a flash drive for the olden days. The news station passed the floppy disk along to the police. Officials analyzed the disk and found evidence of a deleted Microsoft Word document, which was traced back to the Christ Lutheran Church under the name Dennis. And finally, the cops were all like, oh, maybe this Dennis Rader is responsible for all these crimes, you think? Detectives started creeping on Dennis and immediately recognized his black Jeep from past security camera footage. But investigators still needed solid evidence to tie Dennis to the crime. So they decided to pull a sample of his daughter's DNA from a recent medical visit. Officials tested Carrie's DNA against the samples found at BTK's past crime scenes and were able to determine the samples were a match for Dennis. Thank God. And on February 25th, 2005, Dennis was arrested in front of his entire family. He was trying to play it cool and even gave his daughter a hug where he promised her everything would be cleared up in no time. But as soon as he was placed in the back of the cop car, the jig was up. One of the officers asked Dennis if he knew why he was being arrested. And with a creepy grin, Dennis said, oh, I have suspicions why. The dude ended up getting charged for all 10 slangs. He pled guilty on all accounts, and as part of his plea, he gave the disturbing details of his actions in court with a bit of a smirk. When asked why he did all of those terrible things, Dennis said, I actually think I may be possessed by demons. Hmm, I don't think this is a simple demonic possession case. The dude was known to have been fantasizing about these crimes since childhood. Did you forget about his violent mood board? Because I haven't. Well, Dennis received 10 life sentences and was sent off to the El Dorado Correctional Facility, where he will live out the rest of his years. After the shocking discovery, all of Dennis's friends, family, neighbors, and fellow church attendees were absolutely blindsided by his villainous persona. And followers of Dennis's case later clocked Paula for not being suspicious of her husband early on. I do know BTK is a POS who deserves to rot in jail for what he's done. And I deserve a treat for making it through this intense story. So monkey bread it is. See you next time.